Well, uh, so first things first, uh, well, you know, so I, I am from Canada. I moved here about uh, two years ago or so. And I uh, come from Canada where I realize now that I took for granted being able to lay in the grass and have no fear of fire ants crawling over me and trying to kill me. I came to realize that the insects in Texas are quite a bit different. So I'm learning every single day, quite a bit. Additionally, another thing uh, to cover, second most important thing here is that um, my, my name, you can think of it as air, which is kind of what you breathe, and fawn, like a baby deer. So when you put those together, I'm like an inflatable baby deer. <laughs> so one way of thinking of my name. My last name, Bafai, we don't have to worry about because there's no other Bafais in the agri life system in the meantime, so we don't have to think of a way to remember that. So air fawn or inflatable baby deer will suffice. All right, so I want to start off with a, a little activity, and a, and a part of uh, this, this presentation is just going to be recognizing some good bugs or good insects and bad insects. So I want to start it off. This one. Is this a friend or a foe? Oh. Foe. Can anyone tell me what it is? Aphid. Excellent. Uh, we'll go over, in case you're not exactly sure what an aphid is or its life cycle or now, we'll, we'll go through that a little bit later. How about this one? Friend. Friend. Friend? friend. All right, what is this one? Yeah, a certain type of lady beetle. It's, a, it's called a maculated uh, lady beetle. How about how about these? These white things here. Foe, bad guys. It's not as far as saying bad guys. They're not all. You know, there's no good guys or bad guys. It's just bad bad choices. Yeah, these are scale insects, so they are sucking insects. Uh, how about these? What that? What is that? Oh, I think I heard it. Ladybug eggs. Yes, excellent. These are lady beetle eggs. Ew. How about how about these? Larva. Beetle larva. Lady beetle larva. Excellent. Well, you already know the stuff. Thank you so much for having me this evening. <laughs> how about this? Eggs. Eggs. Mealybug. All right, mealybug. Oh. Crit beetle larva. Oh, this crypt man over there. <laughs> you were talking about crypt beetles earlier. This is actually a lady beetle larva. It looks a lot like a mealybug. It's uh, cryptolimus is the name of the genus. It's cryptic. It's uh, mimicking mealybugs. The only one of the main ways you can tell the difference is that they crawl really fast, uh, whereas mealybugs stay quite close. How about this? This is kind of a horrible image, but how about this thing right here? Friend, foe. We're not so sure. We'll find out later in the presentation. The suspense shot real. How about this? It's eagle looking. <laughs> yeah. um, it looks like a thrips. It's actually a predatory thrips. So it actually uh, eats other insects, primarily other mites. So even though it looks like a thrips, it's actually a beneficial insect. Insects are some of the most diverse organisms in the world. There's currently uh, 1.2 million species described. We think there's about 8.7 million species in total. Of those, about 59% are insects. So there's great diversity, and as you can imagine, the vast majority of those are not considered pests. There's very few that are considered pests. Others are either benign, not good or bad, or a number of them actually beneficial, play an integral role, uh, role in our ecosystem. Now before we actually go into, so this talks to me really about management of, of roses, we, get, we need a little short history of management. In the pre-1930s, insecticides were created mostly from naturally occurring compounds. So we had uh, plants, inorganic compounds, petroleum. In the 1930s, with the synthesis of new compounds, such as DDT, we had all of a sudden these magical products that we could just spray everywhere. 1950s and 60s, we get this true revolution. Woo, we're all happy. We're spraying this stuff everywhere. <laughs> and uh, some of y'all were, were reminiscing of some of the stories that you had of when you were actually responsible for dumping some of these chemicals on some different things. It turns out that wasn't the best for the environment. Uh, and we have learned since then. And so uh, we had also this book. Whoop. Well, it's not going to. Here we go. We had this book all of a sudden uh, that was written called Silent Spring, which is uh, you know, written about the, the impact of these chemicals on our environment and what's, what's essentially happening. So Silent Spring was referring to no longer being able to hear the sound of those birds at the springtime. 
So in the 1970s, the USDA created a nationwide IPM program in land-grant universities. And here in Texas, that would be Texas a and University. So what is IPM? I'll show you those traumatizing photos again. Uh, integrated pest management. The idea is to minimize the impact on the environment, minimize the impact on human health, we want to maintain or increase soil fertility, we want to look at long-term pest management, prevent pesticide resistant pests, and this tries to maximize long-term returns and savings. The idea here is that IPM is not quite organic, but it's also not quite conventional. It's not quite spread on a weekly basis, but it's also not quite chemicals are all bad. It's kind of looking at a happy medium, using the best of your tools in order to manage your pests. So there's a little bit of a, a pyramid. The most critical component is starting off with monitoring, is knowing which one's a pest, which one's a bad insect, and which one's a good insect, and scouting on a regular basis to know what's actually on your crop. Next part of the pyramid, cultural and sanitation. That might include things like picking naturally resistant varieties, making sure you're not uh, you know, planting just a monoculture. It might uh, also be other practices that we'll kind of get into in a, in a little while as well. Then we have physical, mechanical, as well as biological, that kind of go side by side. And lastly, as your last resort, is your pesticides. The reason why it's at the very top of that pyramid and is considered a last resort is because it's like a nuke. You're kind of resetting your whole system. So if you have any biologicals in there, you, depending on what you spray, now this isn't always the case, you can be selective on what you spray and, and still be okay, but depending on what you spray, you can knock out this whole system and you're kind of starting back from scratch. All right, so we're gonna start off with, uh, with monitoring. So first what we wanna do is, uh, it always helps to, to kind of delimit your area into what are called pest management units. So let's look at a rose garden here, for example. We have a bunch of different types of roses. This is the Tyler Rose Garden. Who was saying you're going to be going to visit? You don't need to go anymore. Here you go. Here it is. You're welcome. Uh, just save you the gas money. No, it's really nice. It's nice to visit. And uh, so here, there's all these different cultivars and different rows, and you might actually consider these different rows different pest management units. Or as someone, if you're a, a regular landscaper in this area, you might actually notice that certain cultivars get certain pests first. You might notice this red one always gets the two spotted spider mites first, or always gets the aphids first. So you're looking really early and monitoring that cultivar for that pest. And you're looking at the different cultivars that are susceptible for the different pests in order to get an idea of what pests are potentially going to be rising up uh, in your garden, in your, in your landscape area. So that's the idea of an attracting insects, essentially. There's uh, very specific cues that are gonna attract insects. Here's a moth that's been kind of tied down. There's a very specific chemical cue that's been synthesized, that's being produced out of here, and you can see that moth is going bonkers, all excited to try and get at it. You can also use yellow sticky cards. So the color yellow is actually attractive to a lot of different types of insects, whether it be uh, thrips or flies. Actually, thrips are also attracted to color blue, just thought that if you wanted to catch thrips, you can use these yellow sticky cards and uh, check them on a weekly basis. So if they are in your garden, you'll start noticing them on these cards. You just start checking those cards on a regular basis and get an idea of whether you have some of those populations coming in or not. You can also use, uh, there's a lot of do-it-yourself uh, kind of little traps and lures. This is an excellent example of my fellow graduate student and myself, uh, who, are, who are roommates. We had a fruit fly infestation. What good studious graduate students wouldn't. Uh, fortunate for us, we were entomologists, so we knew how to handle the problem. Uh, we just took some bottles and cut off the top and reversed the top, put some tape, put some apple cider vinegar in there, some rotting fruit, and just a couple drops of soap, so that when that, uh, those fruit flies go and sit on that surface, they, they actually can't sit on the surface. That soap breaks the surface tension, and they just fall in. As you can see here from the top, you can see a bunch of these fruit flies slowly going right into our trap. <coughs> in order to know also, another monitoring technique is just recognizing the types of damage. So, for example, you get chewing damage or defoliating damage, it's going to be some type of a defoliator, an insect that can chew. Thrips, for example, cannot chew. They are rasping insects. So they scratch the leaf surface and then they suck. Aphids also are sucking insects. So you're not, if you get chewing damage, it's not going to be one of those. It's most likely going to be beetle or a lepidopteran, which is some type of a caterpillar. 
We also get skeletonization. So that's when you have a single layer of the tissue being chewed through. Again, so this is going to be chewing damage. But in this case, it's often a younger stage larva of one of those chewing insects. So here, for an example, you can see again that skeletonization. If you take a closer look, you can see that caterpillar just hiding right there. So you have to look very closely. You just may be able to find it. Next, we have the sucking damage. Sucking will often result in discoloration. So they are, again, they're often trying to uh, get an actual the chlorophyll. That chlorophyll is a source of protein. Those proteins, they can break it down, make more proteins to make more babies. That's all these insects want to do, is just make more babies and make your life miserable. And this is how they do it. So when they, they're sucking, they're, they're causing that discoloration. You also get wood boring insects as well. And oftentimes, uh, they have very distinct patterns. Wood borers, more often than not, uh, attack stressed trees. So there are something that's a tree that's already stressed and they're coming in as a secondary pest. There are some exceptions to the rule. One example being emerald ash borer, which is just recently found in East Texas, which attacks healthy ash trees as well. So it can devastate all. But uh, there are no wood borers that I know of of roses that will attack a perfectly healthy tree. We also have leaf miners as well. So these are often some type of a fly or some type of a caterpillar that has gone right in between the tissue of the leaf. Very hard to control, typically not a huge problem. We also get gall forming insects, or uh, we can get mites or insects, or it can be some type of a bacteria or a fungi that can cause these types of galls. They're very distinct, depending on the species of the organism that has actually caused the gall. And again, they're not gonna kill your plant, they just might be, if, it, if it's a nursery grower or ornamental grower growing this, then it's a big problem because then the retailer is not going to accept it. If it's out on your landscape or you know, you've already planted it, it's not going to be detrimental to your plant. All right, so now recognizing some of the uh, main insect pests and, and kind of understanding a little bit about their biology. So we got thrips, uh, which belongs to the group Thysinoptera. Thysinoptera, uh, Thysanos means fringe, and Terra means wings. They have these fringed wings. That's where their name comes from. We have many different species. So we have, for example, the greenhouse thrips. We have the adult western flower thrips, which many of you here may be very familiar with, maybe too familiar with. And also the chili thrips, which perhaps many of you here are also too familiar with. In terms of their general life cycle, now this may be a little bit different between the different species, but oftentimes you have the, uh, you have the egg, which you can be in that egg stage in 2.5 to 4 days. Now, these different stages of development vary greatly depending on temperature. So we have a, a relatively consistent internal temperature, right? If your temperature all of a sudden goes too high, you have a fever, if it goes too low, that's hypothermia, that's not good. Insects, on the other hand, their internal temperature varies with, with external temperature. So as temperature increases, their metabolic rate also increases, and their rate of development increases. So all of a sudden, their uh, developmental time decreases substantially, and you can get these stages of growth happening much faster. So then you go into these uh, first instar thrips after that. They can be in that stage for one to two days or so. And then you get these second instars. After that, it's thought now, depending on the species, they sometimes can be above still in the foliage, but oftentimes can also go into the soil or leaf litter as pre pupa. So this is when they'll start to metamorphose and become an adult. And then they become these adults, which can lay 150 to 300 eggs for western flower thrips. And uh, so, it, as you can imagine, if you're doing, let's say you're doing some type of a spray, you're doing some kind of an oil or a soap, you just want to get rid of them really quick and easy and use something not too harsh, you're most likely going to hit all of these ones, but all these in the soil are still going to be okay. And that's why it's often recommended that you do a second spray one week later, so that you're then getting the ones that have just recently emerged out of their pre pupil stage. Is there anything you can do while they're in? Fire. <laughs> you can potentially use an insect growth regulator, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. So one's called Isidoractin, which is extracted from neem seeds. And essentially what that does is it, it, it mimics a certain hormone in insects. So it, it messes up their development when they try to go from one stage of development to the next. It will not affect adults because they're not going to another stage. They're kind of done developing. It only affects the insects when they go from one stage to the next. So it, it may affect the prepupa. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. 
Here are those rasping mouth parts that I was explaining earlier that they'll use kind of to scratch the leaf surface and then they'll, they'll suck the, the juices that kind of bleed off the leaf. And this is the type of damage that you'll see, especially around the main uh, kind of leaf veins. You'll see that discoloration. And in Western flower tips, you can very easily see them with the naked eye, especially on a white flower. Uh, another easy way to kind of know if they're there or not is using a white sheet of paper and uh, hitting the flower or hitting some leaves on that white piece of paper, and you'll see these small little thread-like insects crawling around. Yes? When do they seem to go away with hot weather? Ah. At least that's been my experience. Yes, so the, the, the thought is that they are not very high temperature tolerant. I, I don't know whether that's in the literature or not, but that has been an observation across the board. So it's not uncommon that a lot of insects uh, can't tolerate extreme temperatures, you know, extremely hot temperatures, and that may be the case with western flower grips. Yes? Does dry weather make them grow better than wet? Um, so it depends on how dry. There is kind of a happy medium. If it's too dry, insects desiccate. So they, uh, because they're uh, you know, so small, they can easily lose their water. So if it's very dry, that's not really good for them. If it's also too humid, there can be a lot of, of fun, fungi and other things that can kill them as well. So uh, there's kind of that, that medium place to take at it. All right, so now just a little bit about chili thrips as well. How many of you have faced uh, chili thrips in the last year? It's the last year first. Okay. How many of you have faced chili thrips in the last five years? Okay. How many of you anticipate facing chili thrips this year? All right. If you find some, let me know. I'm looking to do a trial on them. <laughs> so I could use uh, some specimens. Uh, but I'm sure a lot of you already uh, have, know a lot about chili thrips. But just a quick little, I guess, kind of overview. Uh, so they're first uh, detected in Florida in 2005. In 2007, they're first located in yours truly over here. Uh, and they were detected on a number of ornamental vegetable plants in retail stores in Northeast and South Texas. Uh, a lot of you may know my predecessor, Dr. Scott Ludwig. Uh, he was heavily involved in, in some of this work. Uh, and so, and, and I have not yet been so involved in the two years that I've been here. It hasn't, people haven't been screaming at me, we'll put it that way. So uh, it, it, it hasn't seemed like it's been a major problem. Uh, it originated uh, in, in Southeast Asia, where it seems as though many of our insect pests originate from, but if it brings you any comfort, we do also give them some of our insects. So it's a mutual relationship we have. And this is the number of generations you can expect. Uh, now, as you can imagine, so the closer to the equator, you know, the warmer it is. The warmer it is, again, that shorter the development cycle, so the, the more generations you can get. And that basically means the more multiplications in their populations you're gonna get. So here in the Houston area, it's thought that they get about 16 generations in one season. So if you were to get, you know, if we looked earlier, 100 to 200 eggs every single generation, you can get a whole lot of chili thrips. Especially, again, if you have a, a monoculture that is uh, essentially promoting the growth of the chili thrips. They have many different uh, hosts, so they are considered generalists. And, well, here's their, here's their life cycle. So as you can see, also very similar to the western flower thrips. Their damage, uh, again, now, so in this case, you're starting to get some stuff that will actually appear on the stem as well. So first, you'll actually see this discoloration around the main stem on the leaves, especially on the underside. You'll see here some of the damage on the stems. You'll see the leaves curling. Here, again, you'll see uh, discoloration on the actual stems. Here, you can almost get like this lion's mane, looks a lot like witch's broom which looks a lot like rose rosette. So it can exhibit symptoms that would look a lot like rose rosette. And here's what it looks like on some other crops that aren't roses. So if you have some other neighboring plants that uh, are exhibiting signs of damage of chili thrips, it may be something to consider eliminating or removing those plants, if at all possible. The thing is that they are also uh, potential strong uh, transmitters of, of uh, different viruses. So seven reported viruses. The chili leaf curl, peanut necrosis virus, tobacco streak virus, melon yellow spot virus, watermelon silver bottle virus, capsicum chlorosis virus. Uh, none of which will, will really impact roses to my knowledge. Uh, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you've got a vegetable garden, 
next year roses. That may be a concern. Do you know if they uh, transmit rose mosaic? Uh, to my knowledge, they do not, but I, I, I don't know. Uh, this is uh, a great animation showing a hand hitting a flower. <laughs> and uh, if, you're, if you're not sure if you have chili drips or not, and you kind of want to get confirmation, or you just want to send me things because you think it's kind of cool, uh, you can just take some leaf samples, put it in a Ziploc bag with a moist paper towel, not wet, just a little moist. Um, and uh, if you go to my website, which is sixleggedaggy.com, clever, I know. Uh, and you click on forms, you'll find a little form here, it's a small insect submission form. You just fill that out with that Ziploc bag, send it to me, and uh, I'll take a look at it and, and contact you right back. All right, so now going on to two spotted spider mite. Uh, as you can see, they're called two spotted spider mites because of the two spots on them. Uh, it can be very hard to see with the naked eye, at least two spots. You, you can if you've got a trained eye, but it really helps to have a hand lens. Uh, if you have a really high infestation, this, this is a problem here, you'll start to get webbing. So this is a sign that it's a little bit too late. Sprays might become less effective because now all of a sudden this web is blocking uh, that, that spray and it's hard to contact the leaf surface. So at this point you probably want to get rid of this plant or just do some mechanical control. Get rid of the trim, do some trimming. Again, they'll cause a discoloration because they are a, a sucking type of insect. Or technically not an insect, they're considered a, a mite. Here's our life cycle, so you get uh, eggs, and you get these different uh, larva nymphal stages until you get an adult. And that can take anywhere, again, from 8 to 40 days, varies greatly with temperature. So on, when it's really hot out, you, you can get them producing really fast. Are, are all of that cycle all on the plant? Yes, yes, this is all on the plant. Yes. And again, so if you do a spray uh, and you have a bunch of eggs on there, oftentimes that spray might not affect the eggs. So again, you might have to do a another follow-up spray to get anything that was in the egg that has now uh, become that larva or, or a nymph. All right, going on to aphids. <laughs> they suck. They really do. They technically don't suck. They actually use capillary reaction. That's getting a little bit too technical. <laughs> Their life cycle is a little bit mind-blowing. Okay, ignore this whole thing first uh, and just come right over here. This is what you see in the summer get these asexual wingless females. They are producing live clones of themselves, two to three every single day. When the density starts to really increase of these aphids, when all of a sudden they're getting a little bit too compact, and those, those nymphs are starting to hit into each other, those females start producing winged females, because they're starting to sense all of a sudden there's a high density environment, it's time to migrate onto a, a better place. So then this winged female will go find a better crop, all of a sudden there's no low density, all of her offspring will have no wings. They're all clones, but there's just a little physiological mechanism in them that switches on or off to also produce wings or not, even though they're genetically identical. Then all of a sudden you have in the fall time, you have these different uh, physical cues, short day length, cooling temperatures, great habitat, where all of a sudden these asexual females start producing sexual producing asexual females. That means that, that female produces a male and a female. All of a sudden that female can produce males and females. Those males and females go out and they look for other males and females. They mate and they produce eggs all of a sudden. So all of a sudden they're going from producing live offspring to producing eggs. Those eggs can survive the winter and then when it gets warm again, they emerge. You get this foundress, which is kind of the first one that comes out. And then you go back into this cycle again. There's a reason why they are so hard to defeat. Here it is. Here is a mother giving birth to a clone. You can see these, uh, these right here. Uh, one of the ways of calling them is, is a cornicle. These are used often in communication. So they will release what's called alarm pheromone. Whenever they're being attacked, it releases this little bubble, this droplet. It's a volatile chemical. It goes into the air, and all the other aphids nearby can sense it, and they start panicking and freaking out. Uh, this right here is not a, is not a mole. That is the eye of an offspring inside that mother. Those are, that's also an eye right there. If we actually do a dissection of this mother, we will see it's almost like, if you've ever been in a car factory where there's all these cars in different parts of the line, 
It's basically what's happening. This one's almost ready to be born. We got this one, 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 and this one. We got a bunch of offspring that are constantly in the process of being manufactured. Here's again winged aphid. And you can also get red morphs. Again, genetically identical. It's thought that when all of a sudden there's high predator density, they start producing these red morphs in order to warn off predators. Anyone who's uh, kind of familiar with any kind of sucking insect uh, would, would, would be able to recognize this as a, a sign of a sucking insect right away. Whether it be in a, uh, a psyllid or sharpshooter, in this case an aphid or a white fly, what they're doing is they are sucking the plant nutrients, they're trying to get that nitrogen, again, why? They want to make babies to make your life miserable. Uh, so they are just sucking that, that plant nutrient, and then when they extract that nitrogen, they're basically just getting rid of all the rest of that plant sap. And that is called honeydew. It's basically just a sugary solution. They excrete that, and it goes on these leaf surfaces and makes it all shiny. You can also see it right here. And eventually, uh, sooty mold will then grow on top of that, that sticky stuff. And that's when you get then those black surfaces. That reduces the photosynthetic ability of the plant, which can kind of harm its growth and really potentially kill it, but usually it really harm its growth. Can anyone tell me what, what these white things are right here? They're kind of blurry, but can anyone guess? Yes, oh, excellent. Yes, exuvia of the aphids. So when they shed from one stage to the next, they produce these exuvia. It's like they're shed skin, essentially. So that's another sign, if you see uh, these shiny leaf surfaces, and you see these little white things, it's a telltale sign that there are aphids or were aphids. If you're looking around, you see no aphids, some predator has come and cleaned them up, and you're good to go. Can anyone tell me what's going on here? I'm sorry, and what? And eating an aphid? That's one hypothesis. Moving an aphid? Yeah, so it's actually, uh, aphids are often known as ant cattle. It's another term for it because ants will actually pick them up and move them around and herd them, help rear them because they like their sugary honeydew. They like that sugary solution. And they'll actually protect a colony of aphids in order to get this honeydew. So if you see some random little ants crawling around a plant that have no business being on a plant, like it's not a leaf cutter ant, there's a good chance that either you have aphids, they're moving aphids, or they're looking for. So it's usually a good sign to start looking around real quickly to see if you actually see any aphids on your plant. All right, so now, so that was monitoring. We've kind of gotten a good idea of some of those main pests and how to look for them. Now, some good cultural and sanitation practices. Some of them include uh, proper irrigation. So you want to make sure you're not overwatering, underwatering, because anytime you have plant stress, that actually makes that plant more desirable for some of these plant pests. So that is actually a critical component. Uh, sanitation, you want to remove infested plant materials. So whether it be uh, or something like growth or zet, which y'all don't have here in Houston yet, so don't panic when I say that, that word. Oh, maybe you do. So if you have rose or zet, uh, it might mean completely removing that plant. If you have, let's say, some other vegetable plants nearby that have uh, a great source of aphids that you're not really taking care of, it might mean removing that plant and destroying it. Uh, planting resistant cultivars. Again, growing healthy plants. And lastly, and this is one that I'm gonna focus a little bit on, is fertilization. So if you're doing too much or too little, and by too much, I don't mean above the label rate, sometimes I mean actually the recommended rate can be considered too much. So there's a study uh, by Dr. Kevin Hines. How many of you know Dr. Kevin Hines? Have you, have you, any of you heard him speak before? He's also a, uh, an ornamental scientist out of Texas A&M. He's my current PhD supervisor. Uh, he did some work actually looking at different rates of nitrogen and its effect on uh, rose uh, growth as well as the, the pest. So as you can imagine, uh, those, uh, those fertilizers, they provide things like nitrogen. Again, insects want that nitrogen for what? Thank you, making babies to make our lives miserable. And so if you're given the plant too much, then that means that those leaves have an excellent source of nitrogen for those insects, which means those insects are gonna burst in populations. And no matter what you spray or what you do, you will have great difficulty managing your insect. So they did, so let's first look at, uh, they did an example of bugs, and then they did an example of roses. 
But here, so at the, at the bottom, you can see the percentage of the recommended level of fertilizer. So here's 100%, then this is kind of below the recommended level, this is above the recommended level, and this is the rate of change in uh, white, uh, white fly uh, abundance. Sorry, western flower thrips abundance. And you can see when it's at 100 or 75%, you have relatively high abundance. When you go to 50 or 20%, that abundance decreased. So you're actually decreasing your abundance of the western flower thrips by decreasing your uh, fertilizer rate. You can also decrease it by drastically increasing your fertilizer rate, but then you're just, just more money, essentially, that you're spending. Now, if you also, with chrysanthemums, the challenge is, now it depends on if you're in a nursery production setting or if you're in a landscape setting, you're a homeowner. So at 100%, sorry, so this is all doing comparisons of, let's say, plant height of these different levels of fertilization compared to the recommended level. So you see, anytime there's a check mark, that means that they did well. So you could use any of these percentages and it won't impact the plant height compared to the recommended level. However, the number of flowers has decreased if you use only 20%. So you only use at least 50%. The production time also increased a little bit and the, the post-production longevity also decreased a little bit at 50%. In a landscape, this isn't gonna matter all that much if it takes an extra four days to produce or an extra four days for it to grow to a certain stage. Now, if you actually take this to roses, on the other hand, if you're looking at roses, 50% of the recommended fertilizer rate, it actually does not impact the number of flowering shoots, the shoot length, petals per flower, or the base life. So actually, you can reduce it by 50% and see no impact on the rose growth. Additionally, now this is looking at the number of two-spotted spider mites on the plant that either has the high rate of fertilizer, it's 100% recommended, or the low rate. And this is if you've sprayed, let's say, no chemical. And you can see here, in the low rate, all of a sudden you have a great drop in the number of two-spotted spider mites. You're using some other uh, controls. So this is using a chemical control called fluoromite. You can see that you have a, a, an extra impact, again, of low fertilizer rate and that insecticide. We're gonna look at the same thing, looking at the number of eggs of two-spotted spider mites. So this is looking at, at the uh, adult nymphs. And again, you can see that uh, as soon as you use a lower fertilizer rate, you're just by reducing the amount of fertilizer you're putting, which won't impact the growth of the plant, you're actually having a big impact, a major impact on your pest populations. So those are pretty big standard deviations. So they are, standard errors. Standard those are the standard error bars, yeah. absolutely. They certainly are. So with any type of, uh, anytime you're doing these types of trials, your data is typically very fuzzy. Um, but the general trend shows that it decreases quite a bit. Now, this is the egg data. Now, if you look, again, if you're using it with predatory mite or you're using it with flora mite, these are pretty tight. I mean, so that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty clear. And if you're looking at how it affects the adults and the nymphs as well, you can see that it's, it's relatively tight. But you are right, yeah, there is quite a bit of variation there. But again, even if they were the same, you're using half the amount of fertilizer. All right, so next, going on to uh, physical or mechanical control. So this include things like uh, barriers, solarization, which is essentially uh, if you have a, a plot of soil that you know has some insect pests in it, you might put a, a clear plastic over it, and that sun, the heat of the sun, and just some moisture will actually just boil up anything in there, including your beneficials as well. But at least you're starting off with a clean slate. Uh, you have your hosing, or syringing, and hand picking. So barrier, so this is just an example. Now, I don't know how this really would apply at all to uh, roses. But you have this case here where this, there's a, a certain fly pest that can't fly above this height. So they, they did this little experiment here. Where they just uh, put this fence up to see uh, whether that, that fly would go over. Now, mind you, yeah, it can go around. Uh, <laughs> but you, you know, you can do that also with these um, with these, these cups, so these are small plants that there's these, uh, you know, you can get these leaf cutters essentially, or you get, um, yeah, leaf cutters. You get different types of caterpillars that can essentially grow at the bottom of those stems and cause that plant to easily topple over. By simply just cutting the bottom off a cup, and putting that over there, you've excluded, you basically created a barrier or, or created a wall and potentially even make them pay for it. And you can keep those insects out. 
and then hose it. I'm not suggesting, I'm not suggesting that you use a fire hydrant hose here. Uh, but you can also, with some of these uh, insects like aphids or two-spotted spider mites, you can actually, again, like a homeowner situation is a lot different than a nursery. You don't need to use harsh chemicals because you've got just a few plants. Unless you're like some of you that have 500 roses in your backyard, that's a different story. But if you just have a few roses, you can go out there and just hose them off. You do that periodically, just by dislodging them, just on a regular basis, makes their life very difficult and really gives the, the predators a, a little competitive advantage. We have the mechanical removal as well. So if you have some larger insects, you can easily just hand pick them off. You can use a glove if you have to. And, uh, and you can freeze them. So this is an example here. We had some web worms on some apples. Uh, here they are, we collected them. Uh, we used this very basic tool. Uh, so we put them on the ground, we used a shoe. <laughs> we stomped on them, it's relatively straightforward. So we can also, so if you collect them into a bucket, uh, so we had also another example of some Colorado potato beetles on eggplants. And uh, yeah, we had to hand pick them all. It's on an organic farm. You couldn't spray anything, so you hand pick them all, put them in a bucket, and put them in a freezer. Nice and simple. I don't recommend eating them. <laughs> They're a little bit bitter since they eat nightshade plants. Don't ask why I know. All right. <laughs> now going on to biologicals. All right, so this is one of my favorite parts. This is actually kind of my background is in biological control because it really involves insect battles. This is when you start getting these little aliens fighting each other. So, what is biological control? Reduction of pests, the use of natural enemies. In other words, good bug kill a bad bug. All right, this happy little lady beetle <laughs> killing this cockroach, apparently. Um, so some of the advantages, so if you can just imagine, imagine something you can spray that it will find the pest for you, it will eat it, and it also lay eggs and make more of itself. I mean, that's basically a biological control. Additionally, it will adapt and evolve with your pest, so you're never gonna get some kind of resistance to your, your the, this pesticide that you're using. That's a biological control. Again, you also get no environmental toxicity. It can be economic, not always. So sometimes people might just do it because they prefer it. Uh, other times it can actually be a more economic solution. And you also get things like, you get no pesticide residue on the plants, you get no phytotoxicity, and insects are just super cool. If I haven't convinced you of that, I'm sorry. Uh, some of the disadvantages uh, include that they're not immediate all the time. Uh, it requires more human involvement and understanding of insect behavior. Uh, it can sometimes be initially a little bit more costly. You have to tolerate some damage. So in order for your predator to exist, your pest needs to exist. And if your pest exists, that means that it's feeding a little bit on your plant. The idea is to keep that damage below a threshold level. And it can also be challenging in the face of new invasive pests. So if all of a sudden you have a good biological control system going on, and all of a sudden you get a new invasive that your biological control does not attack or feed on, then it can be a little bit of a drawback to the system. And it won't magically fix problems. So you can't just say, I got this problem, let me just do the spray, and hopefully it'll go away. Uh, with biological control, it requires a little bit more persistence, a little bit more understanding, typically, in order for it to work. And there's different types. So you can either get them as sprays, depending on, uh, there's some biologicals that are either beneficial bacteria, bene beneficial uh, fungi, or beneficial nematodes, or there's some that are actually predators, actually larger order organisms. So one example of a beneficial nematode is one that will actually attack a number of different types of beetles and is considered a generalist. And it's this little nematode, it's a little worm that'll go inside the caterpillar, it'll reproduce in there a whole lot until it eventually bursts out for some more work. It's a, it's a parasite. Uh, and you can use it, uh, you, you can apply it using a watering can, a hose and sprayer, backpack, a pump sprayer, or through an irrigation system. You can get very quick uh, efficacy in three to seven days. This is kind of the gateway biological control, especially for growers. This is kind of like where you kind of get them hooked, and then you get them on the harder stuff, like parasitoids and, and predatory life. All right, so then we also got things like uh, lady beetles. This is an excellent video here, it just brings out the joy. You see that right there, alarm pheromone, that bubble just formed right on that aphid, and you'll notice these aphids start panicking. Absolutely, doesn't it just bring relief? Just knowing that these lady beetles that look so sweet on the outside, but like also doing this horrid thing without you seeing it. So they just eat these aphids alive. 
uh, just eat their faces off. What's great about this is as these aphids panic, a bunch of them just drop off the leaf. And in doing so, there's ground beetles down there that will take care of them down there too. So there's really no point of escape. And as we had said before, this is what their larvae look like. Uh, which are almost like little dragons, and they do the same thing. They'll crawl around, grab an ape, and just start oh, yeah. stuffing it into its mouth. So here's uh, the different stages of, of a lady beetle larva, and you can see the mean number of aphids eaten per day. So in the, in the last stage, they can eat about 35 aphids a day. And as adults, uh, let's see here. Oop. Here, as adults, they can eat about 45 to 35 aphids a day. And they can uh, live, oh, did I have their, I don't have that. Well, they also um, lay about 314 to 340 eggs in their lifetime. Now, mind you, things like lady beetles, depending on the species, oftentimes people get the Asian multicolor lady beetle. I hear it across the board. They don't stay. If you buy them and release them, they're not going to stay where you put them. So that's just something to keep in mind. But if you've got a naturally occurring population, that's great. You want to find a way to encourage them. And Cryptolimus, here we go. So this is that what we thought was a, a mealy bug. As you can see here, this is actually the mealy bugs or the scale insects. And you can see this is uh, actually the adult form of this one right here. So this is actually technically a type of lady beetle as well. And this is the larva, and they're just chopping away at these uh, messes. And these ones are actually, so this one is, is called the Mealy Bug Destroyer, such a beautiful name. Uh, they're native to Australia and introduced in California in 1891 to control the citrus mealy bugs. And one larva can consume up to 250 young mealy bugs. That's kind of the reported or the anecdotal uh, value. They're very sensitive to cold, however. Uh, yes, you can. Yes, absolutely. And, and some have said that it can be very effective, mm -hmm. that they can stay there year after year. There are ways of encouraging their populations as well. Uh, this is, who can tell me what this is? Lacewing larva. Yes, green lacewing larva. Oh, ow. <laughs> uh, and what they have, they have these milk parts that basically clamp onto the aphid's head and there's hollow and it injects digestive juices into the aphid, digests it inside the aphid, just kind of like efficient, and then it sucks it all out of the aphid. And, uh, sorry if this is going to give you nightmares. <laughs> Just be thankful that you're not that small. <laughs> and here's what their adults look like. And you'll see them. I've seen them a lot uh, already. If you have some lights on at nighttime, they'll be attracted to those like, lights. And I mean, that, that might be a way to attract them to your garden. I'm not sure. Don't take my word for it. But uh, they are out there right now. And their eggs look like this. I remember when I first saw this, as a budding entomologist, I thought this was some type of a fungus. I don't know what this was. And then I found out it was green lacewing eggs. They put them on these little single threads and put the egg there on the tip. And that's in uh, unripe apple, or immature apple. So their larvae are known as aphid lions. They consume about 200 aphids per week. They work on a weekly schedule rather than daily. <laughs> uh, the females lay up to 300 eggs over three to four weeks, and they are considered generalists. So they will eat a lot of different soft-bodied insects. We also have the minute pirate bugs, or aureus, is another term. These can also be purchased uh, commercially. Their populations can also be encouraged using uh, purple flash pepper plants. That is another thing that is kind of an attractive plant for them and it provides resources for them. And again, they feed virtually on any soft-bodied insects. And one of the distinguishing features is you can kind of see these, it almost looks like a, you know, two black uh, spots on the sides and this uh, kind of white diamond almost on the back. And they're very small. We also have a big-eyed bug. Again, so just because you see a bug that might look like a beetle or might look like a bad insect doesn't mean it's a bad insect. Again, these are uh, beneficials, lay about 150 eggs per female, and they eat a lot of soft-bodied insects. Again, reportedly can eat as many as 1,600 spider mites before reaching adulthood. Ah, and this one we saw earlier. So this is a parasitic wasp. Oh, man, this is my favorite. This is like the movie Alien, except real life. I think the movie Alien ripped it off this, this, this model right here. So this is a wasp. I hope it doesn't go too choppy here. This is a good wasp. 
And what she does is she first sizes up the aphid. And I want you to notice the alarm pheromone as soon as it pops up here. Oh, no, don't do that. No. Oh, alarm pheromone right there. It's freezing. Well, she lays an egg inside that aphid. That egg emerges, and then there's a larva that then lives inside that aphid and continues feeding inside the aphid as that aphid continues feeding. So eventually, nothing's left but a black screen. <laughs> oh, man. Well, let's see if we got the photo. Okay, yes, we have this photo. And so nothing's left but the carcass of the aphid. So it keeps eating the inside, but slowly, because it's like slowly developing. Actually, when it's in that very young stage, it is actually excreting proteins right off of itself that convinces the aphid that it's just another embryo. So that, that aphid is basically thinks that it's just another embryo inside of it and it just keeps feeding it resources. Meanwhile, it's eating all the other embryos until eventually there's nothing left but the carcass of the aphid. And you can see here, so it's a carcass. And eventually it emerges out the bottom and forms this pupa where it'll metamorphose into a new wasp and out it goes to look for some more aphids the alien. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and you have a number of different ones. You have parasitoids that are specific to aphids. You have one specific to white flies. You can see, uh, so in Carcia formosa or Arabosterus rimicus or for white flies, they'll lay 442 eggs in their lifetime or 162 eggs in their lifetime. So that means they'll kill at least that many organisms in their lifetime. Um, there's an awesome one called the Pepsis wasp or tarantula hawk. Again, is another parasitic wasp that will wrestle a tarantula, will sting it, paralyze it, lay an egg on it, the egg will emerge, the larva will eat that tarantula alive, and then emerge as another pepsis wasp. So for every pepsis wasp that you've seen, you know that it's brutally murdered and eaten <laughs> a paralyzed tarantula. It's incredible. Do these wasps also sting people? They will actually parasitize people. That's, you have to be careful, otherwise you will not. They will not. They will not. They, will not. Okay. they are so small, you would just think it's another fruit fly. Yeah, they are very small and they won't hurt people. The tarantula hawk, you know, I'm not sure. There are maybe some parasitic wasps that might, um, you know, be a bit of a nuisance or might sting, but they're not considered by any means aggressive. Uh, and, and if anyone has ever seen this before, so this is a tobacco hornworm, you can see a bunch of, this is what's called an ectoparasitoid. So this parasitoid, instead of laying eggs inside the organism, it lays them outside. And these are all eggs of a wasp. And again, they'll all emerge and eat this caterpillar alive. So if you see something like this in your vegetable crop, so tobacco hornworms can eat a lot in a day, so I wouldn't recommend necessarily leaving it on your plant. But you may consider just removing it and putting it in a place where it's not going to keep eating your plant, but in a place where those wasps can emerge and eat the caterpillar alive, so you can still get that enjoyment. <laughs> in order to be effective in biological control, whether it be you're introducing insects or you want to attract natural predators, one thing you need to do is limit the use of insecticides. And that's, that doesn't mean just limit the use of you know, the stuff that seems harsh in the stores, that also means even soaps, insecticidal soap, is considered relatively generalist. It can hurt uh, the larva of lady beetles, it can hurt parasitic wasps, so again, even something like that can potentially hurt your beneficials. Uh, you want to limit the type of insecticides. You want things that are, that are pretty uh, specific. Things that are systemic would be ideal if you can put it in the soil and it's taken up by the plant and anything feeding on the plant is killed rather than having to spray it onto the entire plant. And that's something that's low residual, something that won't stay there a long time. So the nice thing about insecticidal soap is that if you do apply it, if you don't see any predators on there and you apply it and the predators come afterwards, they're not going to be harmed. So that's, that's a good thing. Uh, you want to provide alternative food sources, so other sources of pollen, nectar, and you can use uh, banker plants. So like we are mentioning, purple flash pepper uh, for aureus. Marigolds are another, considered another beneficial plant uh, in that they can attract both the pest and the predators. So they're kind of considered a little war zone uh, that will kind of keep things away from your, your, your plant. Yes? Ever heard of anything beneficial with red wasp or yellow jackets other than staying in your garden? Not really. I mean, if, if you have a nest in your garden, I wouldn't consider it beneficial. They are, uh, they can, from my understanding, if I remember correctly, they can be predaceous. So they can eat other potential pest insects. So in that sense, they can be considered beneficial. Or things like yellow jackets are pretty aggressive. So again, if you have a nest in your garden, 
it's not worth having them in there, in my opinion. Yes? I, we had uh, worms in a previous vegetable garden, and I could watch the vestibulas fly and take the worm away to put it in its nest. So they were harvesting the bad guys. All right, so the last one, here we go, is to pesticides. So first things first is that um, here is a horrible chart that you can't really see. Uh, and, and what's happening here is there's a number of insecticides. These are all the names of different beneficial insects. And I'm not telling you to read this, it's just, just know that it exists. Uh, this is from Syngenta Bioline, not anymore Syngenta, another company bought them. But uh, they produce a lot of uh, beneficial insects. And they also have this chart that tells you what pesticides, what insecticides are considered compatible with some of those biologicals. So you can find this type of stuff. It's really hard to find this information, but there is some out there in terms of what insecticides or what fungicides. You'll see your fungi, these are all fungicides. You'll notice that these are all green. It basically means fungicides, for the most part, won't impact your beneficial insects. There's insecticides, depending on the insecticides, so this is Avid or Avimectin which is a nursery, uh, kind of a pesticide applicator grade product, uh, it'll kill things all across the board, and it'll kill everything. There's other things that might not. So you kind of want to know, again, using something that has relatively low residual, that is a contact insecticide for a systemic miscontact, you're making sure that you don't have any good insects on there. If you do have good insects, you might wait until they're off, or you might apply a systemic. You also want to always read uh, the, the label uh, very important, especially under the environmental hazards section. Uh, there's a part where it'll say whether it is highly toxic to bees or not. Uh, this has become, you know, a hot topic in the media, especially, and so that's something to pay attention to. Now, especially uh, a lot of insecticides have this mandatory bee box, make it a lot more obvious whether what you're spraying will impact bees or not. If it impacts bees, there's a good chance it'll also impact your beneficial insects. So that's something. To and again, you only want to spray when you've reached a certain threshold. So here, I mean, so this is looking at the value of the crop. Well, this, you know, it could be a dollar value, or it could be, you know, how much is the sentimental value of that crop to you. And here is looking at how much, uh, you know, you should actually tolerate, or at what rate you should actually then spray. So at this point here, so let's say you have, you know, you're, you're, you have a certain valued crop. Actually, let's say your, your crop has zero value. That means you're going to tolerate a lot of damage before you do anything. If it's a very high valued crop, if there's even the smallest amount of damage, you go out there and you spray everything you've got. You want a happy medium between the two. Where, you know, if you have some, if you have, if you have three or four aphids on one plant, you're not going to go out there and, just, and spray it. Actually, at that point, you can just crush them with your thumb. But if you have, you know, just very sparse aphid populations, you might consider not doing anything until the, the population actually gets to a level that reaches a certain threshold. And this varies greatly from crop to crop, so I can't tell you what that threshold is. But based on your experience, that you say, well, anytime there is more than 10 aphids per plant, I know that then it becomes a problem a month later, so I better do something about it. Whereas if it's only a few aphids, and then a month later you see, you know what, they're gone, oftentimes it's because the predators have caught up and managed the problem. You also want to look at things that have uh, low persistence, or you want to look at what they degrade to. And I always find it funny when people say, like, oh, yeah, I bought the soap because it says biodegradable. That just means it degrades into something else. It could be something worse. Uh, this is an example, acephate, uh, which uh, is like seven dust. Um, breaks down first into methamidipose. I'm not going to pretend like I know how to pronounce it. Which is actually 50 times more toxic to mammals than acephate. So first, it breaks down to something that is much more toxic, and then it breaks down to something that's just a little bit more, more benign. Another thing to do is just a spot spray treatment. So if you have, again, you have a bunch of plants, let's say these are beautiful roses, as you can tell, by my amazing artwork, and you have an aphid on one of them, uh, just spray that one area. You don't have to spray up your entire crop. Uh, it's more cost effective, it's more time effective, and also you're not hurting your beneficials that might be on all these crops. Another important thing, if you are someone who is spraying on a regular basis, uh, and who here, does, and not, I'm not judging you, <laughs> who does it? No. Uh, how many of you spray on a regular basis? Okay, okay, so there's a good number. Okay, it's good to know. All right. 
So this is going to be relevant. It's very important to rotate your chemicals. Otherwise, you're going to assist in the, uh, the, the dominance of the insects in the world by becoming resistant. And this is just a very simple depiction as to why. Let's imagine you have some natural variation occurring in these aphids. They all have some variation in a trait of, let's say, uh, you know, they're one of the receptors on their cells for, for uh, taking acetylcholine. Okay, this is actually, this very specific receptor is responsible for about 25% of the insecticide market. Let's say they vary a little bit in that by these different colors. We spray something that kills off a bunch of those aphid populations. All right. All of a sudden now, very few insecticides are going to be actually 100% effective. Actually, I think there's no insecticides that we can say are 100% effective. You might get 99.9999. So if you have 10 million aphids out there, that means you're still going to have quite a bit of aphids left over. Those ones reproduce. You then say, whoa, my aphids are back again. The last spray per worked pretty well. I'm going to do the same thing. You go along again, you spray the exact same thing. And all of a sudden, you'll start noticing the shades of blue and teal are the ones that are left over. Because you've actually helped select for a population whose receptors are not affected by your chemical spray because you keep using the same thing over and over again. So only by actually using something different, and again, if it's something that's going to affect that same acetylcholine receptor, but it's, even though it has a different chemical name, you're technically not rotating. You're actually just, you're, you're again, hitting this resistant population with something that's already resistant. So, how do we know if something is uh, a different mode of action? We can go to this website. All right, what was this? I keep jumping around. Hold on. Yeah, <laughs> love that acronym. Let's go to Iraq. Uh, if you go to Iraq-online.org, uh, that stands for the Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. Uh, so, irac-online.org, where you search for Insecticide Resistance Action Committee. You click on Modes of Action. You can then type in there the active ingredient. So you look at the ingredient list on your uh, insecticide, and you look at what's the top ingredient. It's considered the, the ingredient that's actually causing the effect. Everything else is kind of helps with delivery, helps with persistence, and all that kind of stuff. And you type that in there, and it'll tell you which mode of action that belongs to. So here I was typing in imidacloprid, and that's number four, and it says nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, uh, competitive modulators, and it belongs to neonicotinoids. So it's in group four. Now let's see if it's going to continue playing. Yeah. So here's metaclopril. Again, we got it in group four. There it is. Metaclopril. All right. Now I want to know if I can rotate that with dinotefurane. It's another active I got. Oh man, shoot! That's also under group four. In even group A, so it's like very specifically, almost the exact same group. I don't know if I can use Carbaro. Oh, look at that, that's in group 1A. So that's in a different mode of action. You never really want to spray the same thing more than twice in a row. So you could use metacloprid, uh, you know, one week, and then use it again the next week, then you don't want to do it the week after. You also don't want to use the same mode of action more than two weeks in a row. So you can use metacloprid, dinotefurin, but you don't want to go back to metacloprid. That's using the same mode of action three weeks in a row. So you want to make sure you're rotating your modes of action. All right, so now in brief, going through what, what chemicals can potentially work for some of these pests. For things like aphids and spider mites, uh, you have your very basic products like insecticidal soap, horticultural oil, or azadiractin that will work. Your, your soap basically works by, by uh, degrading that uh, waxy layer off of the insect. They need that waxy layer in order to keep in the water. So they, they use this wax to keep the water in. You wash that off, all of a sudden they're going to desiccate. They can't hold on to their water. The horticultural oil suffocates them. So how they breathe is they have a bunch of little holes in them. And those holes actually go into very small tubes that innervate individual cells in their, in their body. When you use that oil, it covers up those holes. They can't breathe. They suffocate. Azadiractin is that insect growth regulator I explained before, where if they are in the younger stages of development, they, they can't all of a sudden develop to the next stage. Some really funky stuff happens to them. We also have things like metacloprid or dinotefurin that I explained earlier. So uh, again, just read the label. If, if your, your roses or your plants in any way are attracted to pollinators, that's something you might want to be concerned about using. If not, then uh, they are excellent because they are taken up systemically 
and again, they're not going to impact your, your beneficials, and they're going to be staying in that plant for probably at least a season with roses. So you're going to get a whole season-long control of one application. Oh, with things like Western flower thrips, so as the name suggests, Western flower, uh, they tend to congregate inside flowers, which can make it very hard to control if you're trying to get them at that stage. If you're already in flowering stage and you have a lot of Western flower thrips, your best thing to do is to get rid of all the flowers at the same time so you don't have those same populations coming back and then to treat the whole plant. Ideally, you want to treat before you actually get bud open. You want to use one of these different products. There's a number of different products that will work against them. With chili thrips, uh, I'm sure you might have some, even some other suggestions as well. Um, but you can use a soil drench like a metacloprid and a foliar spinatorum in combination so you actually get that long-term residual, you get something systemic, and then also a, a contact foliar uh, spray as well. Are you saying that spinosad does work on the chili? Uh, spinosad does not work. So yeah, so chili thrips is actually resistant to a lot of the insecticides, or I should say a lot of insecticides are not as effective against chili thrips as they are against western flower thrips. So, I'm not sure if there's any other, do you have any other suggestions? What's the trade name of Ooh, the C-H-L-O-R one? Uh, chlorophenopyr? Uh -huh. You know, I don't know. I, I work all in the actives. Because um, we, we yeah. use conserve and we use uh, Monterey's horticulture oil. Okay. And, and those tend to work well in addition. I, I, I'm not sure that we can get, the homeowner can get the C one. That may be possible, yeah. But the other two are Maybe. available. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and they work well on it, as well as conserve. Okay, great. Yes? What's the mode of action of isodirectin? Is it directin? Uh, you know what? I wouldn't know off the top of my head either. I don't know. But yeah, if you just go, do you know? Yeah. In the chili dip trial, uh, Safari was the thing. A, a, a rotation of Safari um, was one of the best. Um, okay, so Safari is the Dinotepiran. Yeah. Uh, so Safari, I think, is a. And Merit. Uh, I think it was a rotation of Safari and Merit were the two. And Merit is a minocloprid. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I, I know the, the trade names of, of the. the Pesticide applicator grade products, because those are the people I, I typically work with. So unfortunately, I don't know the home homeowner grade products. Um, but yeah, so so those neonics like uh, dinotephora and minocloprid can be very effective. Um, and actually, uh, these two here should actually have crosses over them. I apologize. Should I actually have a line through? Does it show up here? No. So there's actually some insecticides that can actually promote uh, the. It can actually promote uh, certain insects. So do not, if you're if you're treating, uh, you'll see over here like imidacloprid. If you're using imidacloprid against chili thrips and all of a sudden you're getting a lot of spider mites, don't keep using imidacloprid because actually imidacloprid can promote spider mite development. So you actually get these, these crazy interactions where if you're using the wrong thing over and over, and there was this one greenhouse that was, they were trying to grow some uh, potted uh, cotton because they, they had a little trial going on and they were spraying everything under the sun for their thrips and for their spider mites and didn't know why they were getting control. They were spraying uh, a version of carbaryl and imidacloprid, uh, which both actually promoted <coughs> spider mite populations. So, yes? Uh, what we've been using for spider mite control would be the water wash doesn't work. Is that effective or random? Okay, yes. Yeah, so that, well, and that, yeah, so uh, I didn't know exactly what's included in this list because uh, that is, again, that's a pesticide applicator grade product. Right? So, right? Yeah, yeah, so that's Avid. How do you spell that? Uh, Avid, A V I D. And Avimectin would be the active ingredient. Yes? <clears throat> While we're on this topic, I, I have a general question. The general question is how effective or systemic? pesticides as opposed to a application uh, uh, externally <coughs> for these particular <coughs> pests? I don't know that I can uh, give you a, a confident and professional answer because I haven't done trials myself or read the literature specifically on that question. So that's something, if you emailed me, then I could, I could read up on it to make sure I gave you a, a good answer. Because I mean, that's 
the easy way. If, <laughs> absolutely. If there are things that are difficult. So I think, especially with things like Western flower thrips, are going to be in the flowers. Right. And you got the chili thrips. I would imagine that the systemics would be the most effective, not only because then it's getting them in the hard, hard to reach places in terms of contact, but because you're also getting uh, season-long control. See, the dogma is, is that that won't go to the bloom. That is true. So it is thought that imidacloprid doesn't go to the bloom, and that's why the thought has always been, well, a solar drench won't affect bees that are feeding on the pollen and the nectar because it doesn't actually affect the bloom. They've come to find that actually that might not always be true. Um, so there are certain nectars or pollens that it does actually reach. It might not reach the, the flower petals, so that much we, we don't know. And I think that's why, uh, yes, yeah, so the systemics are not actually listed here for Western flower threats because of, based on efficacy data, it's, it's not very certain. And that's why, I mean, they're really hard to control once you get them in the flower. But what about systemics in the soil? Does that kill things in the soil? Within the soil, soil, well, that or the soil life, you know. And the soil, like microorganisms or things like that. So, again, I'm not sure if there's been a whole lot of studies done on that. But I mean, what they do know is that when you apply it, it doesn't uh, typically doesn't impact negatively impact plant growth. So, based on that, the assumption is that either it's it's not really killing those microorganisms, or the ones that it is killing, or the, the way that it's changing the soil microbiota is. It, in a way that's not impacting the final plant growth. Yes? Which was the, the two that you said you should draw a line through on spider mites? Uh, Carbaryl and imidacloprid. Okay. Did you say the acetate is seven? Uh, line? Sorry, yeah, that, that may have been a mistake. So, I'm a, so carbaryl is seven here. Uh, you know what? I might, no, I might have got that. Let's see, which one I got that? Yeah, you know what, I, I, I can't remember actually, yeah, sorry. I mean, to mix that one up. Are there any other questions? You can always uh, fire me an email uh, at airfon.bafbi at ag.tanu.edu uh, or you can give me a call at my office and my website, sixlaggedagging.com. Yes? Is this presentation on your website? It currently is not. No. I have some pictures in there that I did not acquire the permission for. <laughs> so uh, I may remove those and then post it up on my website. Are there any other questions? Thank you. That's one. Thank you. Let's see. I think the last pin.